Hallelujah. Ain't God good? All the time and all the time. God is good. Let us pray. God, we thank you today. Uh, we could have been anywhere, but God, we're here. And so we are excited, enamored, if you would, God, to see what it is that you're going to speak to us. Our hearts are open. Our spirits are alert and aware. And we want to hear from you. So Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us. Lead us, God. Us. I gladly step out of the way so that you, God, can speak what it is that you want to speak. We honor you. We trust you. And we love you. In Yeshua's name we pray. All of God's people say it. Amen. 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 Really quickly, I figured I should explain it. I explained it to the 10 a.m. service. Many people have asked, um, why did they hear me pray in the name of Yeshua? I'm finding out that a lot of people don't know that Jesus' name, when he walked the earth, in Hebrew was Yeshua. So in the language that they spoke, that's how they addressed him. When they said, you know, Jesus of Nazareth, they were saying Yeshua. That's his original Hebrew name. We get to Jesus because his name was translated twice. It's translated from Hebrew to Greek, which is from Yeshua to Isus, and then from Greek to English, which is Isus to Jesus. All right? And so the Bible says, at that name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. At that name, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. I encourage you to know which name he was talking about. Hallelujah. Amen. At that name. And so it's a lot of words. Somebody, I had maybe three people ask me, like, what, what, what is Yeshua? And they didn't know that, you know, the letter J is an English derivative. But in the Hebrew, his name was always Yeshua. Amen. So you hear some people say Yeshua. Uh, God's name wasn't God. It was Yahweh. Uh, Yahweh is God's actual name in Hebrew. Yeshua is the son of God, Yahshua, the son of God. Amen. Um, my goal is to always teach you something new so that you do know why we do what we do. Amen. All right. You guys know we are transparent, real, and unedited. We're a true church, so we always want to make sure that we're clear. Being transparent, being real, and being unedited is not just something that we do. It's literally our culture. It's who we are. So you're going to notice that the way that we approach biblical texts and the way that we approach applying the Bible to our lives or the word of God being more applicable is always in a way that it is uh, it's transparent. It's going to be real, in which real can sometimes be unsettling. And it's going to be unedited, which means that I'm not going to only say the parts that we like. Hallelujah. Thank you for the person that said right. I don't know who you are, but I, I trust you. Uh, <laughs> but, but we're going to always be unedited, which means it's not always what we like. Two testimonies really quick. I only had one for the 10 o'clock. I got two now. One of, one of the testimonies is there was a lady that came to me last Sunday. I don't know if she's here, but she came to me in tears in the hallway. She said the last time she was in this building, she was getting an assistance check for $673. And now the, she's back here, and she came back in uh, making six figures. Just showing how God will use the same place but remind you of what he's done in your life. Hallelujah. The second testimony, I waited until now because I didn't want y'all to think I was saying it at offering time because I was trying to trick you with a given. I know what y'all think. He only saying it because he wants us to get I'm not. The woman, uh, Nikita just came to me in the hallway and said last Sunday she was here and that, you know, God just stretched her to give. You know, we don't do money games, so I didn't say give anything. She just felt led by God to give. And she gave the last bit of cash she had in her hand or in her purse. And by Tuesday, she got a phone call from old employment that said, we owe you $3,500. I, I ain't never heard. I ain't never heard of this. I said, what kind of God is this? The wind and seas obey him. How? <laughs> Since when does somebody that owe you money call for you to come get it? So I was like, if you don't know it, don't exist. Amen. But they called her until they owe her $3,500. But you know, you know, they pay taxes on it. But she still said she gave that small bit of cash. And literally God brought, I think it was $2,800 after the taxes within what, a day or two. And um, I only wanted to say that to encourage the people who are like, man, you've been given, not for like the crowd, not for people, but just because you've been led by God. Know that anytime you sacrifice for God, he's going to bless you in return. Amen. Amen. So. I'm going to get into this message because I need all the time. And wow, yowzers. Whew. Let's do it. 
Oh, well, all right, we're going to teach from this subject, God help me maintain. All right. God help me maintain. It's the important part. I've learned more and more in my life, in my journey. It's not just about getting the blessing. It's about maintaining the blessing. The real challenge is in maintaining. It isn't the beginning that is beautiful. It's you having to maintain where the world work comes in. You know, the first day of school for so many of the kids is beautiful. You see all of us as parents, we post our kids in their new outfits. Their, their faces have lotion on it. Their shoes have no scuffs. The shoelaces are tied and remain tied. Isn't that a miracle? They remain tied. It's a beautiful day because that's how you start. But how many parents in the room can admit that just two months later, those kids don't want to go to school no more. They're not excited. You, like, tie them up yourself. I don't got time. You know how to tie them. I mean, the first day you was tying it for them. But by, by month two, you tired too. Both of y'all tired trying to get to school whenever you can. The reality is how we start is the easy part. But it's how you finish. That's the old adage. It's just how you start. That's not important. But it's how you finish. It was Sonia Tekla that gave this quote. She said, making a friend and maintaining a friendship are two different things. Making a friend and maintaining a friendship are two different things. And you know this the moment you hear it because many of us have friends that have come in and out of our life. But maintaining a real friendship with somebody who doesn't flake when it gets hard is the difficult part, right? The maintaining of a friendship, how to remain connected even once things get sour. It's the maintaining that is the real point. And I think that we have to get back to a place of focusing on not just celebrating at the beginning. Okay, God bless me. Okay, I got a new job. But how is that job going six months later? Am I able to maintain my joy while maintaining this employment? Am I able to maintain my peace while going through storms? God, I can't keep living through highs and lows all the time. I do get it that life will consist of some highs and lows. I get it that, that this life can be an emotional roller coaster. Life is, but I shouldn't be an emotional roller coaster. At some point, God, I need you to give me the strength, the know-how, and the wisdom on how to maintain. People shouldn't see me in different modes and moods all the time. Mood swings should not be this consistent. I get it that things happen in life, but God, help me to maintain. Give me some consistency in my life. I feel a preach right here. Give me some consistency. People ought to know which version of me they're going to get the moment they see me. They should know that there's a consistency in my character and how I move. I need help God because I realize I may be unstable. Hallelujah. Thank God for the unstable ones that admitted they're unstable. We're transparent real unedited. Psalms 23, verse 1. I'm only going to read that verse. I'm not reading through the entire psalm today. I think that so often we miss what David was saying because we rush through the rest of that number. We, 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 we read verse 2 and 3 and 4 and 5. We're trying to rush through it, and we don't stop, pause. The Bible calls it a selah. We don't selah when, when David says something so profound at the beginning. In verse 1, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Right? Um, I, I shall not want, for the King James Version readers, I shall not want, I lack nothing. That maintaining starts with who you're putting your trust in. Maintaining starts with who you're putting your trust in. David made it extremely clear at the beginning that the Lord is my shepherd. And I love the way that he said that because what he was saying was, hey, I never needed nobody else to do nothing for me. I still don't need nobody else to do nothing for me. There's only one person I put all my trust, all of my hope, all of my faith in, and that is God. Please don't become dependent on people because your life will always be that roller coaster. You have to be in a place where you say the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. If God is the one taking care of me, then why would I ever worry? Why would I ever fret? If God is the one that's taking care of me, I know that you hear it now, but I want you to let that sink in your spirit. Why would I ever worry? Nobody else is, is, is charged with the responsibility of seeing me every day and meeting my needs and comforting me when I'm hurting. Only God can do it. The God that never slumbers nor sleeps. The God that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. This is where my trust starts and finishes. 
I have the ability to maintain because I'm one with God. He said, I lack nothing. That means I don't lack love. I don't lack resources. I don't lack favor. I don't lack companionship. I don't lack friendship. I lack nothing. I need you to receive this. Loneliness is a lie. I don't lack anything. I don't need somebody else to complete me. Can I preach the way I feel it? I don't need anybody else to complete me. I was already completed when I became one with the Father. God is my supply. And as long as God is my supply, not just money, but my person, God is the one that supplies all of my needs. Because I'm one with God, I've learned to maintain that position, being one with God, knowing who he is and knowing how he moves through me. When you live in lack, you live in desperation. When you live in lack, you live in desperation. And when you live in desperation, you will accept things that you normally would reject. When you live in lack, you live in desperation. And when you live in desperation, you start accepting stuff you would have never accepted. Ain't no way. You would have, you would have never let a friend do you like that before. Never, never in life. But because you, you're afraid of letting people go and who I'm going to have in my corner and who's going to be with me, you start thinking you need people. So you let your walls down. You become a rug and let people step on you to keep people in your life. But it's only because you're moving from a place of lack and desperation because once you are fulfilled internally, you stop being a doormat. You stand up for yourself and say, no way in the world would I let anybody talk to me like this and just be cool with it. I ain't never even been that kind of person. I'm not moving from a place of desperation. I'm moving from a place of identity. I know who I am and whose I am. When you live in lack, you live in desperation. You will take a job you never would have took before, accepted a companion you never would have accepted before. Sometimes it's not until once it's over, you look back and say, I don't even know why I dated them. I don't even know how I, how I even got to that point. I don't know what kind of mind I was in. I don't know why in the world I even accepted something so low. But it's because when you live with an identity of lack, you accept things you would have never accepted. You start letting people get away with things that you would have never allowed them to get away with because of what's happening on the inside of you. So you have to get the position, the posture even of David that says, listen, God is my shepherd. I shall not want. I'm not looking for nothing. I ain't desperate for nothing. You got the wrong one. I am good. I am settled. I am well. I'm complete. I'm fulfilled. I'm one with God. Philippians 1 and 6 he says, and I am certain that God, who began the good work in you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. He says, I'm certain, I'm confident in this one thing, that God who began the work is also going to be the same one who's going to complete it. I'm talking about maintaining. So you got to remind yourself that you didn't start working on you, God started working on you. What we do in the middle of God working on us, we start trying to add stuff on too. But God is able to complete whatever he started. God is able to maintain and you have to learn that God's consistency is unmatched. He alone possesses the full power to maintain you. He alone possesses the full power to maintain you. Nobody's ever going to match the consistency of God. And no matter how hard life gets... You can't fall apart when God is holding you. Somebody just needs that word right there. It don't matter how hard life gets. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with right now. I, I want you to stop speaking those negative seeds the enemy's put inside of you. Uh, you know, I just can't take it, Pastor. I feel like I'm falling apart. I feel like I'm unraveling. I feel like it's just too much. You may feel that way, but even in your weakest days, that's when God begins to hold you. You are not going to unravel in the palm of God. As a matter of fact, he said, when I'm weak, that's when I'm most strong. Because it's when I step out of my own way, I trust the hands of God. You can't fall apart because God... God won't let you. I'm speaking to somebody. You can't fall apart because God won't let you. It doesn't matter what happened. It doesn't matter what, what, what's occurring right now. You cannot fall apart because God won't let you. I got to push through this. I got to keep going because I got a lot to say to you. Jude 1 and 24. You should find it fast. There's only one chapter in Jude. Right? Jude 1 and 24. It says, now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away 
and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. Now, this is powerful because it says, now unto God, he's the one, unto Yahweh, who's able to keep you from falling away. Now, now that didn't mean you're not going to fall. You're, you're going to fall. I thank you for the 10% of amens. I want to see if anybody else going to be honest in church, at least on the Lord's day, that, that you're... You're going to fall. See, that's why, that's why, you know, church people rub me the wrong way sometimes. You kind of be honest. I know pastors don't say that, but they do. They rub me the wrong way because what we've done is we created this climate and culture in church to where as long as it's talking about somebody else, it's amen, hallelujah, they did it, pastor. God needs to fix them. And then I say, well, what about your faults? No, no, buddy. You and I are both flawed. God doesn't have any perfect options. Remember we said that last week. God doesn't have any perfect options. We're flawed. You know what that means? That means that you are going to fall. But even when you fall, God will make sure you don't fall away. You're going to have difficult days. You're going to have days where you say, you know what, I could have handled that better. You're going to have days where you say, you know, I could have did better in that. You're going to have moments where you feel like, man, I'm battling it. And I feel like my flesh is trying to get the best of me. And, man, I slipped up and I did this and I, and I made a mistake. And it's okay. But the Bible says a just man falls seven times, but he gets back up again. This means that the, the power of it is making sure you don't stay down when you get down. Okay? God alone, God is able. Not you are able, so get that out of your head. God is able to keep you from falling away. That means even when you want to drift, he holds you. Even when you're at a place where you're like, you know, I really just want to disconnect. I'm really just tired of people and I'm tired of the whole process. God in that moment will begin to grab you and hold you. Some of y'all don't even want to be in church right now, but some kept pulling you. Somebody invited you. Somebody sent you a message. Somebody irritated you with a morning devotion. And now look, here you go. Because God has a way of pulling you in. Even when you don't want to be poor, thank God for keeping me when I didn't want to be kept. Thank God for holding me when I didn't want to be held. All right, I got to hurry up. That maintaining doesn't mean you never fail. It just means you never quit. It doesn't mean you never fail. It just means you never quit. And this is the, the, the power of this that I feel like nobody talks about um, the work that, that comes with maintaining a blessing. Nobody talks about that. that there's a work that comes with it. It's not just about getting blessed. People say, you know, I get blessed, I get blessed, get blessed. But yeah, but there was a work that comes with maintaining. Somebody say maintaining. maintaining. There was a work that comes with maintaining a blessing. You no, know, getting the blessing is just the beginning. It's just the first part. But there's a work that comes with the blessing. You no, know, getting your house is the first part. Remember, I bought my house. I'm happy. I'm holding the keys. I did it. All right, you so happy. People post, congratulations. Right, everybody be, they be happy for you. And then you, you forget that that's just the first part. And now you got to fill the house. This apartment don't got enough furniture. I'm in empty rooms now. Just like, um, I'm going to just put a bing bag right there. You done made a meditation room. You don't even meditate. You just putting stuff. Right, you got to fill the house, and then you have to maintain it. You have to keep it up. Nobody tells you that the frustration that it's on you, but the roof start leaking. I'm frustrated. Who do I call to come fix this? They're like, you, sir. You, you're, the, you're the owner. No, nobody's going to come fix it for you. It's now. You have to pay for that. I'm like, I don't got no landlord. No, you're the lord of the land. <laughs> lord, fix it. Right? Nobody talks about you know, the cost of having to maintain. You know, the, the married folks probably ain't going to say amen, but get married, the easy part. Yeah. Hallelujah. Bless his wonderful name. Get married is easy. You look beautiful. Your makeup's on point. You worked out, lost 15 pounds. You walked down the aisle. Your friends were with you. They celebrated. Nobody objected. You thought you were good. You walked down the aisle. You danced, first dance, last dance, money dance. You felt so good. Ooh, this was my special day, Pastor. Well, what about when life don't feel special? Nobody tells you the cost of maintaining the blessing. 
I don't want to just get it. I want to stay it. What is the cost of maintaining the blessing? God, don't let me lose what you bless me with. I want to speak this. You got to get to a place of saying, God, don't let me lose what you bless me with. Give me the power to maintain it. I don't want to squander the blessing because of my life, my behavior, my character, or my problems. God, give me the power, the authority, and the ability to not lose what you have blessed me with. Here's the big one. God, don't give me anything I can't keep. Hallelujah. I felt that one. God, 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 don't give me anything that I can't keep. You know, you know, it's, it's so much harder once you had it to lose it. You know, it's so much harder. You know, once you, if you would have never had that car, you would have been fine. But once you lost it, it's, it's, it's almost like once you lose the home, once you lose the friend, the relationship, like once you lose it, you feel something different. So I'm challenging you to be in the place of saying, God, don't just give me the power to maintain, but don't give me anything, God, that is not mine. Because once I have it, I want to keep it. I don't want any borrowed blessings in this season. I, I only want what God has for me. I don't want it. No borrowed credibility. I only want what God has for me. If it's yours, I'll celebrate with you, but I don't want a piece of it. If God got that for you, let it be for you. I'll wait my turn because what I don't want to do is hold on to somebody else's blessing, dress it up as a pretender, as something is mine. I will wait. I will be patient. I will be still and know that he's God until my time comes. Until my time comes, I don't want temporary joy. I want something that sustains. I don't want the peaks and the valleys. I want something that sustains. I want God that what you give to me, I'm able to be consistent. I can maintain what you're blessing me with. Galatians 5 and 7 says something profound. It says, you were running the race so well. Who has held you back? Who has hindered you that you would stop following the truth? He, he, he's encouraged them, but at the same time, he's sad. He said, man, y'all were, you were doing so good. You were running so well, but who hindered you? Notice it said, who hindered you, not what hindered you. Who, not what. Your biggest hangups in life will always be who, not what. Your biggest hangups, your biggest hindrances in life will always be who, not what. That's why the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, take a note of it. It says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Evil communications corrupt good manners. What it's saying is when you're hanging around the wrong people, it pulls you away. For what God has for you, it messes up your vision. It messes up your focus. You got to be around people who are where God is about to take you. Because if you're not around people who are where God is about to take you, you will start looking back and lose focus. You'll start looking back and diverting back to who you used to be. You got to remain in the place where God, I can't surround myself with people who don't understand when you're getting ready to take me because they think my level of seriousness is a joke. They think I'm doing too much. I'm not doing too much. If you saw what God showed me, then you would understand why I'm fighting the way I'm fighting I am headed somewhere you got to surround yourself with the proper kind of people the right kind of people Jonathan McReynolds said it this way he said God when you said you can heal me from anything did you mean people yes I knew you said you were a healer God but I never knew that you would have to heal me from people he said, I, I, I won't call them out. I don't know their names. I don't know the trauma, which one to blame. It's just people. It's people. It's always going to be a who hindered you. Who? Who? I want you to look at your life and ask yourself, are there any relationships that are hindering me right now? Ask yourself that. Are there any relationships that are hindering me right now? Is there anybody in my life that I know is connected to me? And let's just be honest, be honest about it. They are not helping me move forward right now. Oh, I know it's uncomfortable. They are not helping me move forward. At best, I'm dragging dead weight. You know it when they call you and now you get into a place you don't even want to answer. You're looking at the phone and you, 
I'm going to call you back. You, I'm, a, I'm doing something real quick. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the store. You start making up reasons not to talk because your spirit is alerting you that what's getting ready to be dumped on you is garbage and you're tired of being a trash can. You feel like I have to be focused with people who see where God is taking me. It's that some people can't stay connected to you because they will hinder your growth and your assignment. Some people can't stay connected to you because they will hinder your growth and your assignment. And I learned that God will remove people from your life. But it's up to you to remove them from your testimony. I learned this one personally. God will remove people from your life. But it's up to you to remove them from your testimony. What we do sometimes is God has already healed us. But we keep resuscitating people by how we talk about them. You'll keep re-injuring yourselves because every time you got to retell the story, you refill what you felt. I'm trying to preach it plain. You refill what you felt when you tell the story. And I learned that God is removing people that we keep bringing back to life because of how we tell the story. They don't even have to be. Can I give you a real message? They don't have to be a part of your testimony. They are not that important. Your testimony is what God did, not what the enemy tried. Oh, I wish you would get this for real. Your testimony is what God did, not what the enemy tried. You keep talking about what the enemy tried. I'm talking about what God did. Come on. Stop giving small people major roles in your story. Stop giving small people major roles in your story. The only big person in your story is God. Verse 8 says, it certainly isn't God. He said, who hindered you? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. All right, so when it comes to this ermine, all right, pastor, how do I know? Uh, we always talk about people, all right? God uses people. The enemy uses people. How do I use this ermine? And how do I grow to know who's supposed to stay and who should I be disconnected from? It's a real question. How do I do this? How do I make it applicable? Let's be transparent, real, and unedited, right? Any relationship that brings bondage isn't from God. Any relationship that brings bondage isn't from God. He's the one that called you into freedom. So why would he send a person that pushes you further into bondage? We struggle with this because oftentimes the ones that pull us into bondage have a place in our heart. Hallelujah. The ones that pull us into bondage have a place in our heart. So we have a hard time letting go. And what we're doing is we're handcuffing ourselves to prisoners who are bringing us into their jail cell until we let go and say, God, you know what? What you have for me is better than what I had past tense for me. I'm able to trust you and release it so that I can receive what you have. Anything or anyone that entices you to divert from your purpose and or from God is a temptation. Anyone or anything that entices you to divert from your purpose or from God is a temptation. Anyone. It's a temptation. It's something the enemy's trying to use to entice you. The things about a temptation is it's always something you want. You cannot be tempted by something you don't want. So what the enemy does is he beautifies the package. He beautifies the package, right? Because that's the way you'll receive it. And none of you will let a wolf into your yard. But you would let a sheep because you didn't know a wolf was inside. And none of you would gladly receive a monster, but you receive a kind person who has a monster inside. It's the packaging that deceives you. It's a temptation. It's what the enemy tries to use to pull you away. Now, what does the Bible say about temptations? 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. This is my last verse. I'll be done after this. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, it says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. Now, I love the way that this verse starts off because what it does is it tells you, calm down, simmer, right? Because what we do is in our heart moments, in difficult seasons, I've been there before. I'm not, I'm not talking just about you. I've been there. In our heart moments in difficult seasons, we get into this place of, like, man, why, why is everything going bad for me? Right? Like, 
Why is this happening to me? I try to do good. I try to be right. Why me? Why people betray me? Why people turn their backs on me? Why people do me like that? I just love people. I just be kind and try to help folk. But people do me like this. And what the enemy is getting you to do is he's trying to boister up. He's trying to build up what you're going through and make you feel like, woe is me. You're just the worst person in the world. You're the only nice person that ever been betrayed. But let me just kind of lighten the load a little bit. We are looking at a room. When I talk about betrayal, you want to know why everybody say amen? Because it's a room full of people who have all been betrayed before. When you talk about letting go of you know, old friends, the people you can't stay connected to, everybody says amen. You want to know why? Because we all have been in spaces where we had to let go of somebody we did not want to let go of. Let me just encourage you. You are not the only one going through it. No, no, I got to help you with it. I know you want to say, hey, man, it's cool. I'm going anyways. You are not the only one going through it. Don't let the enemy trick you into thinking, woe is me. I'm the only one. I just don't want to be here anymore because my life is so hard. Welcome to life. Every single last one of us will have to live through what you are experiencing. But it's not about how you live through it. It's about how you get through it and praise God on the other side. He says here, the temptations of your life are no different. For what others experience, I know it's hard. You lost a friend. Welcome to the club. I know it's hard. You lost a relationship. Welcome to the club. Oh, you are divorced. Sorry, 60% of marriages are in a divorce right now. You are part of the majority now. Like, this is what happens. This is the difficult part of life, but how do we handle this? It says, and God is faithful. My favorite saying right now, I'll run through that wall. God is faithful. People keep asking me, how do you just go through what you go through because God is faithful? How are you still smiling because God is faithful? How do you still have your joy because God is faithful? How do you keep going because God is faithful? Why didn't you quit, Pastor, because God is faithful? Why didn't you give up because God is faithful? The car accident couldn't kill me. The sickness couldn't kill me. The bullet couldn't kill me. And I'll be darned if I let something else kill me. God is faithful. God, let me tell you something. I ain't talking about you or me because, you know, we be flaky. I'm saying God, God is faithful. He will never make a promise he can't keep. He's the God of Israel that never slumbers nor sleeps. God is faithful that even when you quit, he keeps going because God is faithful. Uh, let me calm down. Wusa. God is faithful. I said, I was, I'm sorry. That was personal. God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. Stick with me. Don't disconnect yet. God will never allow the temptation to be more than you can handle. You are underestimating what he put inside you. You are underestimating what God put on the inside of you. You're like, man, this is too much. God, I want to quit. I don't know, God, if I can carry it. And the whole time you're saying you don't know if you can carry it, you're walking. <laughs> I don't know if I can do this, God, and you're still walking. I don't know if I can keep this up, but you still, I don't know if I can keep going, God, but you're still going because you have underestimated the power that God has put on the inside of you. You may have a soft exterior, but the lion of Judah is alive on the inside of you and the enemy cannot destroy it. That's why he's angry. That's why he keeps attacking you because of the lion, the roar on the inside of you. It says, he will not allow the temptation to be more than what you can stand. That even when it's crazy heavy, you're still standing. Even while you're weeping, you're still standing. Even while you're hurting, you're still standing. Even when the enemy is plowing on all that he can, you're still standing. He says, and when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can't endure. He says, he's going to show you a way out. God's going to show you that, that you are going to find yourself in temptation traps in life. You're going to do it. But God will always show you a way out. I want to give you this word. I want to give you this word. Whenever you feel like the temptation, the attack, the trial, the circumstances lasting too long. 
I want you to ask yourself, God, did I miss the exit? Am I still in something that you were trying to show me the way out of? Did I miss the exit? Did you show me to let go and I held on? Did you show me to leave and I stayed? What happens because our emotions get in the way. If you look around the building, you'll see there are exit signs. And the exit signs have to be lit. This is law. They have to be lit because they find, found out with the human psyche that when we get frantic and emotional, we miss the exit. When we get frantic, we miss the exit. So it's like you got to light it up because what people will start doing is trampling over one another. Because they won't see the exit. They'll just follow the bodies. And I'm challenging you because what if you are only following what's been in front of you and you miss what God was trying to show you? Um, I feel this so heavy. Two things happen in order for you to find the exit. Two things happen. Number one. You have to be still to get your emotions under control. He said, be still and know that I'm God. I'll be exalted among the heathen. I'll be exalted among the earth. You have to be still because your emotions can paralyze you. Your emotions can blind you. Be still. Not because God doesn't want you to move. He doesn't want you to miss. Not because he doesn't want you to move. He doesn't want you to miss. He said, be still. That's number one. Number two, ask yourself, God, where's the exit? Because God would never put on you what you couldn't bear. So often if you can't bear, that means you're carrying something God didn't put on you. You, you carrying folks you were supposed to let go of a long time ago. You you carry a family member you're supposed to let go of a long time ago. Some of y'all in financial burdens because you keep using your blessing to pay off somebody else's penalty. You, they don't honor God, won't live for him, but every time God blesses you, you take your resources and, and spread it out amongst the family. But they never do it for you. They would, they would never take their resources and give it to you, but you feel that because you're so kind and so nice and so loving, you're taking your blessing and your pearls and casting it before the swine. And now they're trampling over God has given to you. God, did, did I miss the exit? Did you tell me to let go and I'm still holding on? Did you tell me to release and I'm still grabbing it? Did you tell me something and did I miss it because I was too emotional? I was too emotional. Did I miss what you were saying, God? I want you to just be calm for a minute. If you're in a season of burden and weight and you're trying to maintain, I want you to say, okay, God, you said I'll be able to endure it, but the only way to endure it is, God, you will show me the way out. Show me the way. I, I want you to, to say that from your heart. God, show me the way. Show me the exit. Because remember, he said it's never supposed to be that hard. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And when it gets too heavy, you got to ask God, am I carrying stuff, people, relationships, friends, you never told me to carry? It's only heavy because I added on my own weight and dragged it with me into purpose. Let me pray for you. I'm done. Father, this is my prayer. God, that as you're helping us maintain, I pray, God, that specifically they would know, God, when you're showing them the way out. God, sometimes the weight, the heaviness is because of things we've picked up. We have lauded ourselves, God, with more weight, but not because you gave it to us, because we picked it up. God, we thank you that you've given us this army, but we pray, God, that we use it, that we would be still and know and not be blinded by our feelings and our emotions, but trust, God, that you will never, ever put more on us than we can stand. So, Father, I pray for clarity, for discernment and direction that you would help your sons and daughters maintain. And Yeshua's name, we pray. All of God's people.